You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 40, The Spanish Civil War, Part 5, The Attack on Madrid. After the failure of the coup, the nationalists knew that they had to start making progress if they wanted to ensure that they were capable of carrying the war forward. They needed to expand the territory under their control for political, military, and economic reasons, but also for diplomatic and propaganda reasons as well. There were many paths that they could take if they wanted to at this juncture. There was a lot of Republican territory that could be targeted. The Republic was still in control of an enclave that stretched along the northern coast of Spain and almost the entire eastern and southern areas of the Iberian Peninsula. The first order of business for the Nationalists was to join the large mass of Nationalist territory in the northwestern parts of Spain with those areas of the south where the Army of Africa would be advancing out of after they made it to across the Straits from Africa. After these two pieces of territory were joined together, the next target was somewhat obvious, Madrid. Madrid was the capital of Spain, and with its location in the center of the peninsula, it was within striking distance of a nationalist advance. Capturing the city would be a huge political victory for the nationalist forces, and so it would be the site of one of the first major battles of the Civil War. For their part, the Republicans were very aware that Madrid was a likely target, and they fully expected the attack to be launched although they did not have high hopes that they would be able to stage a victorious defense. The most important tool that the nationalist cause possessed in the early months of the war was the Army of Africa. It was made up of troops and officers with more experience than any other military formation in Spain, and they were able to cross over to Spain thanks to the help of German and Italian aircraft. There would be between 12,000 and 14,000 men brought over the Straits and into Seville in an airlift that would begin in early August, with Franco coming over on August 6th. This would be an important turning point because it represented a huge strengthening of nationalist military forces in Spain. Before August, it might have been possible for the Republican forces to launch an attack into nationalist areas, but after the arrival of the Army of Africa, such actions seemed almost doomed to failure. The Nationalists planned to use the Army of Africa as a spearhead in their first major set of offensives, designed to greatly expand and consolidate the territory under their control. It would be at this stage that the difference between the experienced and organized military units of the Army of Africa and the largely inexperienced and disorganized Republican forces would be most sharply felt. In the disorganized early weeks of the coup and the Civil War, the workers' militias had proved that in the correct situations, they were a very potent fighting force, especially in their own urban environments. However, what they would experience in the opening offensives of August and September was something very different. In the unfamiliar areas of battle in the field, they made mistakes and were put in situations for which they were simply not prepared artillery fire, flanking maneuvers, proper entrenchments, and many more areas of military training were often lacking, which put them at a severe disadvantage. The result was a string of Republican military failures and nationalist military successes. Franco's forces would advance north very rapidly, making an advance of almost 500 kilometers from the south to the town of Talavera de la Reina in a bit over a month. Along the way, any Republican resistance was often easily dismissed through a combination of artillery barrages and flanking maneuvers. This resulted in the often outnumbered Nationalist troops seeming to be unbeatable, and their reputation would begin to precede them along their route of advance. 
There were instances where Republican forces did mount a solid defense. Generally, this would occur when the nationalist forces made the mistake of advancing into urban environments, where the advantages provided by their military hardware and experience were far less pronounced. However, these instances were the exception. After arriving in Talavera, the southern forces were able to link up with the troops that were under the command of General Mola in the northwest. It would also put the nationalist forces about 100 kilometers from Madrid. At this point, the general expectation was that Franco would order his commanders to advance on the capital directly, but instead he chose a different path. He ordered an advance on Toledo, where a nationalist garrison under the command of Colonel Jose Moscardo had been besieged inside the Alcazar, a castle that was first restored back in the 1500s. During the coup, Moscato had led an almost 800-men force of the Civil Guard in joining the uprising, and eventually they would be joined by over 200 other men to defend the Alcazar. They were also joined in the siege by several hundred civilians, mostly family members of the Civil Guard. The siege that had began in late July, and as the Army of Africa advanced, it was into September, and it was still going. The siege had taken on heroic proportions for the nationalists, and Franco made the decision that it would be better for his troops to relieve the siege. As the Army of Africa began to advance on Toledo, many of the militia units in the area began to retreat, although some did give a spirited defense of the city. When the nationalist troops finally reached the Alcazar, it was reported that Moscardo greeted them with the message, quote, nothing to report at the Alcazar. As with many rescues of beleaguered garrisons throughout history, the actual impact on the ground of this relief w- was minimal, but its propaganda value would be very potent. Moscardo would soon be promoted and he would go on to command an army later in the war, and the story of the Alcazar at Toledo would be known throughout Spain. The nationalist advance on Madrid would be the first major military campaign that involved both the men that had been in Mola's army in the north and the Army of Africa from the south. It would begin in October 1936, and it would be Mola who was put in direct command, not Franco. The plan was for multiple columns of nationalist troops to converge on the city, with three columns moving in from the south, southwest, and west. This moment before the attack on Madrid uh, was something of a high point for nationalist forces in terms of their reputation. From the end of the coup until the attack on Madrid, they had done little other than continuously achieve victories. And this success greatly boosted nationalist morale, and it was also met by the negative effects that it had on Republican forces. There seemed to be little doubt that Madrid would simply be another successful attack. During October, the advance on the capital continued, and by the 21st, nationalist forces were just 30 kilometers outside the city. A few days later, they would take Terrajan de Velasco, just 30 kilometers from the city center. By the 24th of October, the advance was in kind of a partial ring around Madrid, at all about the same distance, with each column having advanced to about 30 kilometers from the center of the city. On the 23rd of October, the first bombing attacks on Madrid would be executed by German aircraft. It was at this point that the final preparations for the attack on the city began, although there was a slowing of the advance as these preparations took place. This included the organization of food convoys behind the front, with nationalist optimism being so high that they were just operating under the assumption that these convoys would soon be moving into the city that was in nationalist hands. The months of September and October had been frantic times for the Republicans. They had been trying to do something to slow the nationalist advance, and there was little doubt in their minds that the next target was Madrid, This would also be the period during which the first major efforts were made to morph the militia columns, which had been such a large part of the Republican military effort, into more traditional military units. This included the establishment of the Mixed Brigade concept, which was made up of 4,000 men, and would become the primary Republican unit during the war. More men would also be mobilized specifically for the defense of Madrid. There was also many efforts put into not just making the men available, but also boosting their morale as much as possible. For example, on October 28th, Caballero would take to the radio in a radio broadcast which would state, quote, Listen to me, comrades. Tomorrow, 29th of October, at dawn, our artillery and our tanks will open fire on the enemy. Now, he, he was not lying with this statement, and in fact, the next day, 15 T-26 tanks, which have arrived from the Soviet Union, would attack near Sicina, to the southwest of Madrid. 
The T-26 was a very capable tank, at least in comparison to any other tanks around the world. The Soviets had also sent technical and knowledgeable officers under the command of Captain Pavel Harman. The results from this attack were disappointing, with the failure due in no small part to the inability of the tanks and the infantry to properly coordinate their efforts. They would not be the first or the last military force of the 1930s to have serious problems in trying to coordinate infantry and armor. After the Republican counterattack efforts were rebuffed, the leaders inside the city began to fully prepare for the attack, an attack that they believed would almost certainly be successful. This meant that the primary way that the Republican leaders prepared for the attack was to leave and move the capital to Valencia on the Mediterranean coast. This movement was made during the night of November 6th, with the provisional Junta de Defensa being left behind with orders to defend the city. Fleeing the capital in the middle of the night was not a good look, but in the wake of the removal of the national government, the same groups that had proven so effective in meeting the coup also began to act in Madrid. The anarchists and communists began once again to reform their militias and to form local committees. Mass mobilization happened, just as the nationalist forces were beginning to enter the outskirts of the city from the south. Anna Lois Strong, an American journalist in Madrid at this time, would write in her book Spain in Arms that, quote, Behind the lines, the civilian population poured into the streets to strengthen the barricades. These grew in a week from the most amateur structures to solid fortifications, shoulder-high walls of cobblestone cemented into place by a military plan. In all Madrid streets towards the rebel front, I saw them, these intervals down the main thoroughfares. They guarded entrances from every side street and alley. Building these walls and seeing how the people's forces held the enemy, the week of panic steadily passed into the growing conviction that Madrid, defended by its citizens, need not be taken. And the slogan began to pass from mouth to mouth of the defenders, Madrid shall be the grave of fascism. Now the Junta de Defense and the communists collaborated in a series of mass arrests and executions of those that they felt might endanger the defense. The number of people killed during this time are difficult to determine. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. All the while, the nationalist advance continued, with militia units falling back from the outskirts of the city. The first probing attacks into the city began on November 5th. These were launched by units under the command of Colonel Valera, and he was trying to determine the best path forward. A key part of the nationalist attack plan was to move through the Casa de Campo, the old royal hunting grounds which made a roughly 5 kilometer sized triangle which pointed directly towards the center of the city with the point being less than a kilometer from that center. This would provide the great benefit of avoiding as much street fighting as possible. Uh, there would be other diversionary attacks further south, but the primary goal was to move through the Casa de Campo onto a line which ran from the Ciudad Universitaria to the Plaza de España. 
The attacks would begin on November 7th. However, the day before, a set of operational orders was obtained from an Italian tank which had been destroyed. These were then forwarded up the chain of command of the Republican forces. This information allowed General Mieja to reposition some of his troops. Troops might be an incorrect term to use here, because what Mieja commanded was a mixture of various militia units, many of which had not seen any real fighting. In total, less than half of the forces available for the defense of the city had any experience at all. While there were some units of cabaneros and regular soldiers, the largest group of defenders were untrained volunteers, many of which only became available in the previous few days, some of which had never even fired a weapon. The one thing that they did have were numbers, and there would be twice as many defenders as those available to the attacking forces. There would also be international brigades which would arrive to defend the city, which included the 11th International Brigade, which would play a part in the defense. The international brigades were units made up of international volunteers from around Europe and the world that had arrived in Spain to help the Republican cause, primarily facilitated by the Comintern. While they would participate in the battle, it's important to be clear that they made up only a small percentage of the total defending force, only around 5%. They would prove that they were incredibly brave and very ready and willing to fight, but their contributions to the fighting would be amplified by the propaganda groups within the Spanish Communist Party to make it appear that the defense of Madrid had been a communist victory, an international communist victory, and to try and get more volunteers to come to Spain. We will be discussing the international brigades in much more detail at a later date. When the initial attacks into the Casa de Campo began, they made some progress, but they were unable to move through the area completely and into the urban areas on the other side. These attacks were costly failures, and Varela would switch the emphasis of the attacks to the south, on the southwestern edge of Madrid. Here, the nationalist forces ran into the problem that they had always experienced when attacking into populated cities, house-to-house -house fighting against militias that were from the area and knew them very well and, and knew how to defend them. They would inflict heavy casualties on the attackers while mostly holding their ground. While the Republican forces were able to defend quite well, almost any attempts at a more proactive defense ended in failure, like attacks to the south of Madrid, where four Spanish and the 12th International Brigade attacked to prevent a possible nationalist attack towards the Valencia Road. It did not go very well. Back in the north, the, the attacks did continue to slowly grind forward, although at great cost. On November 19th, they were finally able to push across the Manzaris River and establish a position inside the Ciudad Universitaria. However, while they pushed the front forward a bit, it was clear that after the attacks once again slowed to a halt, it would simply be another long grind trying to continue forward, and this caused the nationalists to shift their approach. Instead of actually continuing forward with what had become incredibly costly attacks, which had often resulted in large casualties to the best nationalist units, the attacks were slowed, and instead air and artillery assets were increased, and a bombardment of the city began. The theory was that this would cause morale in the city to break, both among the militias and the people. This was a common theory that was held around the world at this time, and would be well into the Second World War. And as with many other later examples, here at Madrid, it did not work. If anything, the bombardments just caused the resolve of the defenders to harden. With little change in the situation, the battle for Madrid turned into the siege of Madrid, with the nationalist forces digging in and commencing a series of occasional bombardments as the focus of nationalist efforts shifted elsewhere along the front. It was an important victory for the Republicans, the first major victory since the Army of Africa had become involved, but it also caused Madrid to become incredibly important to the Republic's propaganda efforts, which made the city almost a black hole which would absorb resources until it finally was captured in 1939. The failure to take Madrid either by an open attack on the city and then by bombardment left the nationalists at a new crossroads. A meeting would be held near the end of November with Franco, Mola, General Orgaz, and Varela in attendance at Varela's headquarters. There was, of course, the option to simply keep slugging away at the frontal assault on the city. However, this was greatly discouraged. Mola was heavily against this option due to the very valid concerns that further attacks would simply continue to be incredibly costly. Franco agreed with this, and so they began to look at possible options to encircle the city. There were two options. They could either move south of the city across the Harama River, 
or they could attack to the north, which was the path that they chose. We'll come back to that southern route across the Harama River in a few episodes. The final decision was that there would be an attack launched to the north, which would attempt to first capture the areas around the Corona Highway to the northwest of Madrid. This area had several geographical obstacles and was largely made up of olive groves and orchards, which was quite a bit different than the more populated areas around Madrid. One of the problems was that the area was made up of thick-walled villas called castellos, which would provide the defenders very nice strong points on which to anchor their defense. The initial forces available for the attack were about 17,000 men in three columns, which would be thrown into the attack on November 29th. They were facing a much larger group of Republican units, which had been combined into the Central Army near the end of October. The resulting second battle of the Karuna Highway would be a lengthy ordeal, which would span into the early weeks of January. The initial attacks would catch some Republican units off guards, and some units would break completely, often as a result of their neglected defensive preparations, which was very common. However, in some other areas, the, the attacks did not do quite as well, and in very few cases did these attacks actually achieve their often very lofty objectives. Throughout the process, new nationalist attacks would be ordered, like on December 7th, when Franco ordered a surprise attack to be launched to try and continue the advance forward, hopefully all the way to a position between the Sierra de Guadarrama and Madrid. However, when this attack was launched, an operation that was heavily dependent on surprise, it was met with a thick fog that made it challenging for the attack to be launched. It would only really get started three days later on December 16th, but then, shortly thereafter, fog once again returned. By the time that the fog lifted once again on December 19th, the element of surprise had been completely lost. Republican reinforcements had already arrived. Another attempt was made on New Year's Day, and with another advance involving about 12,000 men and 30 tanks uh, in this occasion. The Corona Highway was actually approached, and finally, on January 6th, the Corona Railway was cut to the west of Puzelo. On January 8th, Aravaca was taken by another nationalist attack. However, they were unable to move to the north of the highway. They were just kind of stuck on it. As January continued, the weather became a greater and greater obstacle. It was dropping to freezing on January 11th when another attack was launched. While another further small advance was made, it did nothing to greatly change the overall situation. Then the battle finally ended in mid-January, and nationalist attempts to encircle the city and to cut it off from the resources from the north was unsuccessful. They had captured a solid stretch of the Karuna Highway, but had failed to make further progress. Casualties had been heavy, with Orgaz claiming that his units had suffered 15,000 casualties, although that number might be exaggerated. Republican casualties were probably between six and 15,000, with a lot of variability there, due to some concerns that numbers were once again purposefully inflated. However, on both sides, fresh troops began to arrive, which caused the entire situation north of Madrid to solidify. The failure of the Corona attacks meant that both sides were in for a lengthy bit of fighting around Madrid. Now, the attack on the city directly had failed, and the first attack to the north had also failed. Now, the nationalists weren't done yet, but it was going to take some time. On the Republican side, the transition of the militias into a more organized military force continued, with the mixed brigade system being implemented in more and more units. However, there were many issues with equipment which still remained. This was felt very clearly during the winter months when the Republican soldiers, often with little more than a rifle, ammunition, and a blanket, were defending poorly constructed defensive works around Madrid. They had performed far better than many had expected up to this point, but it remained to be seen whether the success could continue. On the nationalist side, they were concerned far more about expanding the troops that they had. By the final months of 1936, they had been able to bring the total number of nationalist forces up to about 200,000, with about 60,000 of that number coming from the Army of Africa and new recruits from Morocco. The rest were made up of nationalist militia units, volunteers, and a growing number of conscripts. The militias, mainly Carlists and Phalangists, would need to be incorporated into the military establishment, much like on the Republican side, but the Nationalists would do a far better job of that. Next episode, we will focus on a very important topic for both the Nationalists and the Republican war efforts as 1937 began, international involvement.